Florida Peninsula and more specifically for us in the state line region that does have implications in how the weather can be affected for the Big Bend. So this is the zoomed in more of a localized scenario all of our regions still within the cone of cost possible forecast movement and it does highlight around Thursday into Friday. That's when we could have the closest approach of Ian to our region. Some very important details that we're going to outline over the next uh, 10 minutes or so that can really help to fine tune what kind of impacts we can have weather wise from the approach of Ian. One thing of note in the extended forecast track, it is shown to weaken from its peak strength around category three, four in the southwestern side of the uh, southeastern side of the Gulf off of southwest Florida and it will weaken into a lower end hurricane. Still a considerable hurricane. Nonetheless, any hurricane that comes close to our region is something that is quite considerable to say the least, but at least the overall trend shows it in a downgraded form as it makes its approach near or in the Big Bend area. We cannot discount the possibility that we can see the center of the hurricane coming close to some of our regional territory in the Big Bend. So that's just the reality of the positioning of our forecast track. So with the assumption that this track is going to pan out by Thursday, Friday, that would give us the general effects of prolonged heavy rain, maybe upwards of four, six, seven, eight inches in some cases. We can have steady tropical storm force winds in a broader extent of our region, including in southern Georgia. Along the coast, there is that possibility for occasional hurricane force wind gusts that would be 74 miles per hour or greater. And I don't really foresee it being a prolonged sort of hurricane force wind event for us. We would certainly have the chance for some gusts, especially closer to the coast and closer to where the eye would make landfall, which again could be anywhere within the, our region based on the forecast track. Plus, we have to monitor for the coastal storm surge, especially near and to the east of where the eye passes. And even across our western areas with the onset of onshore winds around the circulation, that can have an impact across the Forgotten Coast too. So we can see higher water levels, rough wave action, uh, just very poor surf, and that can cause maybe some coastal flooding and some beach erosion as well. So here's what you need to know as of 5 p.m. on this Sunday afternoon slash evening. The tropical storm is actually a bit weaker. It's southeast of the Cayman Islands where hurricane warnings are in effect and hurricane warnings are extended into the western tip of Cuba and more of a United States focus. There's a tropical storm watch for the lower Florida Keys. That's a new advisory that just came out. The first set of advisories for Ian here in the United States, but it's in the far southern tip of the Keys. It's still expected to strengthen into a major hurricane by Monday into Tuesday as it enters the Southeast Gulf and from there it moves north or northeast. And it's been something we've been honing in on for days and days. A northeast turn makes a big difference in what we can expect and what we can feel here in the Big Bend region. As I've been saying, water temperatures are extremely warm across the entire Atlantic Basin, the Western Caribbean and the Florida Straits that's where the warmest waters are located and that's going to be just the high energy fuel that the eventual hurricane can use to gather organization, get its structure going and generate those strong winds with the expectation over that patch. It can go from a reasonable category two to a very intense category four before it starts to enter that weakening mode. And we'll talk about that weakening mode very shortly. But while it still has that opportunity to go over those warm waters where there's not enough upper level winds to disrupt the circulation, that's the combination that gives us a higher level of intensity around the Isle of Youth, western tip of Cuba and west of the Florida Keys. Now when it gets into the eastern and northeastern Gulf where we are, the atmosphere is going to be different. There's going to be drier air and there's going to be faster upper level winds above, which means it's going to kind of shear off the tops of the clouds and interfere with the structure of the hurricane, likely hurricane by that time. So I'm just going to throw that phrase out there. That will trigger its weakening trend from an intense hurricane to maybe one that is not so intense. Still, you don't want a hurricane of any form coming close to where we are. But if we do have to take the deal that's been given us, at least the overall expectations and forecast show it to be weakening. Now, the northeast turn all depends on this front that is still going to come through our area tomorrow and into Tuesday. It's going to set up to the south. The front is pushed in by strong upper level winds, a trough of low pressure, and that's one of those steering mechanisms that can kind of guide a tropical storm one way or another. 
if that trough, if that upper low digs far enough to the south and lingers for a bit, it can more easily pull E into the northeast, and that can mean a cross over the peninsula. If that trough kind of retreats or is a little bit weaker, that means more of a northerly path that it can take, which would direct it closer to the Big Bend. Today's overall thinking in the computer modeling is that it's going to be somewhere in the middle where the trough is not going to be incredibly strong to make it bend right up into southwest Florida, but not weak enough or far away enough to make it just go straight to the north. So there's been this leaning where we can see maybe the core of the hurricane, a weakening hurricane, moving into the Sun Coast, Nature Coast area of Florida or the far southeastern Big Bend. So we're starting to narrow down the possibilities. Even though the forecast cone is still wide, we're getting a little more guidance that maybe something along the west coast or the eastern side of the Big Bend could be the target for the center of the hurricane. Now, we need to focus on a lot more than just the center, but we're using our exclusive Barron Development Index for tropical systems. Shades of red indicate where there's favorable conditions, water temperatures, light wind shear uh, to allow a system to form. So right now, all that region in the Western Caribbean, the Southern Gulf, we have that combination that favors more development. But as we go through time, the forecast track rolls out. These green shades show atmosphere conditions that are unfavorable to sustain a hurricane. That's the combination of drier air and stronger upper level winds being considered in making this northeastern segment of the Gulf where we are not so favorable to sustain a strong hurricane. So that's another part of the mix that leads us to believe there can be a weakening trend as it gets near to the northeastern Gulf. And again, we're not showing, or at least we're not indicating the straight red line showing where the exact impact is going to be. It is going to be different from this, but at least we're honing in a little bit more on that northeastern corner of the Gulf. And over the next couple days, we'll be narrowing that down even further. So with all that said, there's plenty of reason to continue to be ready. Make sure that uh, hurricane or disaster kit is stocked, refreshed. Uh, I went around my house during my break to check in on the flashlights and uh, I need a few batteries. So guess what? I'm doing the same thing, making sure my plan is set, my family is set. Only you know what you specifically need for your family to get through a potential rough weather situation. Even if it's just some hours of rain and squally, gusty winds, uh, you'll still need some uh, preparedness in that case. And if it's something worse than that, you still have to prepare for maybe something worse than just squally weather. Uh, when we start to get in on advisories and watches and warnings, which I think are possible, quite possible under these conditions, that's when you may need to get set to put your plan into action. Uh, we're not quite there yet. I'd say give it until about Tuesday when we may start seeing some local uh, watches that can be issued. That's the possibility I'd say on Tuesday, not set in stone that we will have advisories or watches, but given the overall track and its proximity to where we are, it would not shock me one bit if we start seeing some tropical storm watches or such being issued by the midweek time frame. So there is the expectation that we will have some effects. Well, we can't disregard that signal that's been very strong for several days. It does not mean we're going to have another Hurricane Michael. It does not appear to be like that. It's a whole different setup and no two storms are the same. But this can be a large uh, system as it moves into the eastern and northeastern Gulf. And even with a weakening trend, it's going to cause it to not be so potently uh, strong wind-wise, but it can spread out the overall wind uh, dynamics, if you will, and maybe spread out the wind gust field even broader. It doesn't mean there's going to be hurricane force winds all over the place. It just means we can have some sustained hours of steady tropical storm wind gusts and perhaps even sustained winds. That's a possibility, and I think that's going to be the, the main effect that I think we can get going into Thursday and Friday. Rougher water starting on Wednesday and then rain and wind gust effects for portions of Thursday and Friday. So that's what we're looking at. I still have a lot of data to analyze and we still have several more runs of data over the next several days to really hone in on a specific solution to where we can actually parse out western areas can get this, eastern areas can get that. But we can't get into those specifics right now because it's just too broad of a possibility to see a wide range of conditions across our area. So it's reasonable to be ready uh, for later this week. We still have a couple of great weather days, maybe a little bit of slight rain chance for tomorrow, but that front brings in more dry air and that can actually help us out to 
get Ian to be not quite as fierce as what's expected to be when it's over those warmer waters. A whole lot more information on our digital channels, on our website, our news app. Just search WTXL ABC 27. You can download our Storm Shield app and our news app. We keep those fresh updated all the time with the latest information regarding Ian. And we'll be doing these streams every so often outside of our newscast when new updates come out from the National Hurricane Center. So to wrap things up in the next couple minutes, Ian, still a tropical storm, actually a bit weaker than it was earlier this morning, but still set to roll over those warm Caribbean waters where it's likely to grow and intensify and go into a range of rapid intensification uh, Monday and Tuesday as it crosses the western tip of Cuba and enters the southeastern Gulf where we still have some implications as far as rain, wind, uh, storm surge and coastal flooding for really the entire west coast and those implications do draw uh, north to where we are. So plenty of uh, things to keep in mind over the next several days. Tomorrow, I know some schools are already out of session for a fall holiday. The weather's great for the kids to be off if you're in that case, but watch for Wednesday when weather starts to deteriorate offshore and then Thursday when it comes closer to where we are. I'm first to know Chief Meteorologist Casanova Nurse. I hope you join us on ABC 27 at 630 for our evening news broadcast. And again at 11, we'll, we'll have a whole lot more information on Ian, its forecast and its expectations as far as its implications and effects here in the Big Bend and Southern Georgia. Have a good evening.